Okay, this is a review for HESI exam one. So for HESI exam two, we'll do a different review, but for HESI exam one, I've given you the topics to look at. I've given you some prep materials. Um, what we're going to cover on this is a little bit of that, but mostly we're going to cover the topics we have not covered in class yet. They are not a big percentage of the exam, but at least you will have been exposed to some of that material. So just a few prep things. We've covered most of this. So you should have already been doing this, but if you haven't, maybe this will remind you to do it. Um, you should be doing NCLEX questions every day because DSN requires that. Everybody should be doing it, but how you do it is really the secret. You really need to read those rationales. That's where you learn. That's where you can see if you're thinking too deeply or what kind of critical thinking do you need to apply. The HESI prep book, I, I think that's very helpful because it's more specific to HESI. It does all the body system reviews. It has HESI hints. You can spend some time reviewing your weak areas there. Uh, the study guide from previous quarter's topics we've talked about. Every quarter I talk to students and ask them what helped them the most with HESI. And one of the big things for the last couple of quarters is taking that list of topics from the previous quarter's exams dividing it among the class and creating a big giant study guide. The only concern I have with those is you are very unlikely to get the same exam as last quarter. So don't think that that covers everything. It's broad and you need to look at it in a very broad sense, but it is because there are so many topics to cover, it is kind of nice to divide that up with the, the class. The PN3000 questions, these have been recommended by several students. They're on the LRC computers. Um, most students say those are very similar to the actual HESI HES questions. And then lastly, utilizing those prep quizzes I give you. I mean, that that's designed to make you see if you've forgotten some things from last quarter because a lot of what we have on HESI is MedSurge 1 stuff that we've been referring to again and again in MedSurge 2, but you learned it primarily in MedSurge 1. Now some general tips for the exam itself. Go with your gut. This is the biggest mistake I see people make. You look for all these error, all these little tricks and things that you've seen on our unit exams and they'll have tricks but it will not be the same kind of trick. It's going to be much more broad so you've got to think broadly, don't think too deeply and the way to do that is to practice that with your NCLEX um, practice questions. So you've got to go with your gut response. Don't try to make this harder. So an example of that is this. I had a quiz question that said, the physician orders an MRI of the brain for an adult male patient. Which of the following findings in their history should the nurse report to the physician? Allergy to contrast dye, implanted cardiac pacemaker, COPD, or hernia repair? So most people know COPD, hernia repair have nothing to do with MRI. Mark those off. So allergy to contrast dye or pacemaker, well you should know that you can't do an MRI if you have a pacemaker. Could you have a safe pacemaker that's specially made for the MRI? I suppose, but that's not expected. The typical answer is we don't do MRIs if you have a pacemaker. We can't turn them off, we can't reset them, we just don't do them at all. The dye, could we have an MRI that had dye? Yes. Do all MRIs require contrast dye? No. So you got to think more broadly and not try to make that too specific. Uh, take the time to read the rationales after you finish your HESI. This is the most important thing I can stress to you because you have one opportunity only to look at those rationales and those rationales are what is going to tell you what you need to do to prepare for the next HESI. So even though I know you don't get your score until after you look at the rationales, and I know that you start looking at them and you're like, I missed number one, I missed number two, I missed four, I missed five, I missed six, I missed eight, I missed nine, I missed those ten. You start getting freaked out that you've missed so many. Just keep reading. Suck it up. Read your rationales. Remember, too, that this is a weighted test. So... It isn't how many you missed, it's which ones you missed. And there's also some questions that are just being validated. So they don't even count, and you don't know which ones those are. So I've seen people miss 13 or 14 and still get a 90-something percent. 
So try to just get over that and read your rationales. Also, please utilize your personal HESI remediation. I know that it is enormous. So do some specific things like only use the quick guides. So look at the quick guides. If you read that and you go, oh yeah, I got this, then move on. If you read it, the quick guide, and you're like, I don't remember anything, then use the in-depth guide. So that will help you prepare for that HESI number two. Now I've already given you this list of primary topics. Just a reminder, I have reviewed several quarters worth of HESI reports. Not just the, the ones you saw last quarter, but multiple quarters. And what I've found is these are the primary areas. These topics make up about 75% of the exam, or about five questions per topic. So I've given you some subsections that I see over and over on that list, but it's certainly not comprehensive. This is just a reminder of things for you to look at. It's kind of what I base the prep quizzes off of. So these are the things, the topics you ought to be reviewing. So you've got cardiac, respiratory, endocrine, renal, and then neuro, hematology, musculoskeletal, and liver GI. Now that means they'll ask some other questions, but they're just not big categories. So what I'm going to cover in the rest of this audio is the topics we have not covered in class before you take that first test. So um, all of the reproductive stuff, male, female, reproductive, HIV, AIDS, sexually transmitted diseases, um, and then eyes, ears, and skin. Just these will not be big topics. You're not going to have a lot of questions. I just want you to at least been exposed to some information so that you can make a critical thinking choice when you're asked these questions. Now please remember we don't see the HESI exam. So I don't see the actual questions. I see the topics like you have. I have to use what I see gets tested on standardized tests to make these choices. So this is my best guess as to things that are important. I certainly don't have any kind of inside track. So this is the best guess for you. So with HIV and AIDS, just a few facts. The asymptomatic HIV infection often lasts for 10 to 12 years. So patients um, get infected, they often don't even know they're infected, and they may not know they're infected that whole 10 to 12 years until they are diagnosed with AIDS. But if, let's say, they practice a, an unsafe behavior and they were afraid and they went and got a test and they found out immediately that they had HIV infection, this is kind of what will happen. So usually they are the most infectious in the first six months, again, where most people don't even know they're infectious, they don't even know they're infected. And then they have a very low period of being low risk infectious until they develop AIDS. That's that 10 to 12 years. However, they are infectious forever. Even if they get a report that says they have an undetectable viral load, they're still considered infectious during that time. Where they officially develop AIDS is when their CD4 count is less than 200 or they develop an opportunistic disease, and then that's where they have transformed into AIDS and so just HIV infection. Testing, the rules from the Centers for Disease Control is anyone with any sexual experience is considered at risk for HIV infectious infection, and so we test, and really the CDC recommendation is anyone aged 13 to 64 should be tested. So everyone should be tested once, and then if you practice any risk behaviors, you should be tested regularly. So that means the recommendation has nothing to do with your sexual orientation, nothing to do with your lifestyle, nothing to do with anything except age, 13 to 64. Also, if they do a rapid HIV test and it's positive, you have to follow that with the second test, which is the Western blot, and then that confirms the HIV infection. So one test is not enough. Now the testing is changing, but that's generally the rule. Um, when someone has HIV infection, we test them regularly, their CD4 count, T-cell counts, and viral load. That helps us decide when we need to start treatment with medications, and also if they're getting medications, are those medications working? The treatment is antiretroviral therapy, or ART, and it's usually multiple drugs from different drug classes. 
It does not cure HIV infection. We have nothing to do that, but it will decrease the replication, delay the disease progression. Um, the treatment is always combination therapy because it's very easy to get drug resistance. So we're trying to catch in different phases. It is expensive. It does require commitment. It causes side effects. Um, it has to be taken every single day at the same time every day. Uh, it can... The need vaccinations on here is because their immune system's low, and so we want to keep them well. Who do we treat? We treat all women because they can pass HIV to their babies. So regardless of their health, regardless of their viral load, regardless of their CD4 count, we treat all women for that reason. Once they've had the baby and they're not getting pregnant again, then they can stop treatment if they want to. Um, Typically, we only treat patients that have a CD4 count of 500 or less. There's some variation to that, but that's the general rule. Right now, we do not treat people that are not infected as prevention, but that's kind of changing too. So general rule, less than 500 or um, a woman. Sexually transmitted infections or STDs, diseases, uh, a couple of general rules, and then I'll give you specifics for specific diseases. Treatment is oftentimes a single dose, but our rule in our teaching is no sex until the treatment's complete, and we consider that seven days. So if the patient will not do that, then you would recommend condoms, but the, the recommendation, the initial recommendation is no sex at all. Remember that all STDs can have a latent phase where they're asymptomatic, but they are infected. In fact, most STDs are, don't show symptoms, especially in women. So that means you can still give it to someone and you don't know you have it, and you don't know someone else has it and they give it to you. So this is why if you have any unsafe behaviors, you need to be tested and then you need to prevent with condom use. The treatment is going to be oral IM or IV. Rarely IV, that would be only very sick people. But creams are often ordered. They are not a treatment. The creams are there for comfort to deal with symptoms. They absolutely don't treat STDs. You also must treat all sexual partners. So that's for the last 30 to 60 days. Or the patient gets reinfected. So important to ask that and to ensure they get treatment. Also important to know that uh, not all STDs are curable. So the viral ones, that's herpes, HPV, and HIV, there is no cure. We can treat, but it remains in your body. It never goes away. If we are able to cure the STDs like gonorrhea, chlamydia, syphilis, most people will get them again, not because they had treatment failure, but because they got reinfected. So it's pretty rare that the treatment doesn't work. It's more common that their partner didn't get treated or they're now with a new partner that gave it to them again. Here's the specific treatment for the specific STIs. If you have gonorrhea, you almost always have chlamydia or vice versa. So we always treat you for both, which means you will get two different drugs. For HPV, there's really no treatment. That's uh, genital warts. So we can use surgeries or chemicals to remove them, but there's no true treatment. The Gardasil vaccine is what prevents them, and you do need to know that and why we recommend it. It's because HPV is the most common cause of cervical cancer, and, and then it's other STIs. So we're starting to see oral cancers and anal cancers too. So the Gardasil vaccine prevents that. Um, it is to be given to people aged 9 to 26. 26 is the absolute cutoff. Now, physicians can order it for patients older than that, but it's not recommended. So for testing purposes, 26 is your cutoff, and it's an absolute age, even though it's kind of a weird age. We do give it to females. We do give it to males. Males can't be tested for HPV, but we know they transmit it, so they need it too. The idea is we give this shot before any sexual activity. However, they can have it if they've had sexual activity. It covers for several strains of HPV, and so our thinking is they haven't been exposed to all of them. So we prefer it, but they can still have it. They cannot have it when they're pregnant. And it is three shots, 
they're given over a six month period. There's a time frame. It's not super tight, but there is a time frame that to follow. Herpes, know that herpes can be transmitted even if the patient has no lesions at all. So that means that they always need to use condoms. Um, it also means that if they have lesions, they're even more transmissible. So we recommend no sex at all if they have lesions present. We do treat it with acyclovir. Again, it cannot be cured. The acyclovir can be given for outbreaks, but it can also be given to suppress, like people that get frequent outbreaks or they don't want an outbreak at a certain time or it's causing pain or whatever, they can take it to prevent. Syphilis is the weirdest one. It has a lot of weird things. It, it can cause dementia. It can cause death. So it's very different than the other ones, and it is very contagious if they have lesions, which is only in a certain phase of syphilis, and it is treatable. Now, male reproductive, uh, you ought to know about BPH, that's benign prostatic hypertrophy and enlarged prostate. First, you need to understand it does not increase your risk of prostate cancer. It is a separate thing than prostate cancer. It's quite different in exam when they do their digital rectal exam when you have cancer versus BPH. It does cause the same symptoms, though. Um, with decreased urinary stream, increased frequency of urination, dribbling, because it, it causes compression of the urethra and so the urine doesn't come out as easily. Several things to treat, um, Flomax or Hytrin, these are antihypertensives that actually relax that urethra so it'll help with their symptoms. Um, remember those are going to cause low blood pressure even if you're not taking them for blood pressure reasons, that's what they're going to cause. No decongestants, these can cause constriction and so the urethra would narrow instead of expand. Also, don't let them restrict fluids because they have this dribbling and sometimes incontinence, they want to restrict their fluids and you should remember from urinary that that's not a good idea but they can restrict it to like daytime, 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. to kind of help that nocturia. The treatment often is a TERP, a transurethral resection of the, a transurethral resection of the prostate. Um, and there are several care things you ought to know about that. We do bladder irrigation after a TERP to keep the flow and keep everything open. We should expect light pink urine with a few clots, not a, not bright red urine or dark red urine and not big clots. If we get those, then you have to apply traction on the catheter, which is where we pull the catheter um, balloon up against the bladder wall so that it constricts the vessels. Also, we give belladone and opium suppositories, which is kind of unusual. They don't really do that for anything else. The risk of that surgery is incontinence and that can last for weeks afterwards, so you know what you should do for that. Um, erectile dysfunction would also be a risk, and usually the, there are ways we can deal with those. Prostate cancer is often very slow growing. There are some aggressive forms we're more concerned about, but usually it's slow growing. Every man after age 50 should be screened for this routinely, yearly, with digital rectal exam and a PSA blood test. Understand, though, that the PSA blood test can be elevated for other reasons, lots of reasons. So it is not diagnostic of cancer. You always have to do a biopsy to diagnose. If they are diagnosed with prostate cancer, then they usually do surgery or radiation. Sometimes they wait if they're older, and very common to get erectile dysfunction and incontinence after these surgeries. Prostatitis, obviously that's an inflammation of the prostate. They need antibiotics, they need anti-inflammatories, and the weirdest thing about this is we suggest that they have sex or masturbate to relieve the discomfort from that. Priapism is an erection lasting longer than six hours. It is a medical emergency. The treatment for that is sticking a needle in the penis and draining the blood. So most males, not real excited about that. So they need to go to the emergency room before that happens. Cryptorchidism, anytime you see that word orc, you need a, that is referring to the testicles. So cryptorchidism is undescended testicles. 
what you need to know is that's found usually in children and if it doesn't resolve on its own it needs to be corrected with surgery otherwise it does increase the risk of testicular cancer we don't really know why but it is a known risk factor so speaking of testicular cancer testicular self-exam needs to be done for males monthly like breast self-exam they do it in a warm area they feel each one it's expected to have one testicle bigger than the other that is not abnormal that's expected also it's expected to feel a little cord because of the the spermatic cord in there what they're really looking for is a change in texture or lump painless lump typically if they do have cancer they'll have to remove those testicles um, and they should bank their sperm before that happens no matter their age vasectomy just one little fact when they do that uh, the body still has sperm for about six weeks so until they come back and confirm that there's no active sperm they need additional form of contraception for that time erectile dysfunction what they usually test on is the age so you need to know that for younger men so ages 20 you know teens and 20s it's almost always alcohol or drugs that's causing that and they just need education for middle-aged men when they come in and they tell the doctor they want Viagra they need to be they need to have a full physical exam because oftentimes that impotence is a symptom of diabetes or hypertension or cardiovascular disease and that's what brings them in remember those don't have a lot of symptoms those disorders and so the doctor can certainly give them Viagra but they need to do a full physical and make sure that there's not a systemic disease they need to treat epididymitis is on this list because I know it's on HESI oftentimes because several quarters it has been this is usually it's an inflammation of course usually from an STD or some other infection so you do treat it with the antibiotics um, but prevention is good hygiene and condom use to prevent STDs. For breasts, just a couple of facts. Mammogram is uh, required annually starting at age 50 is what's recommended. I mean age 40, not 50, age 40. If you're high risk for breast cancer, then we do that a little bit earlier. The reason we don't do it in the 20s is that's not a high risk for breast cancer, plus your breast tissue is dense. So it doesn't really show much on the mammogram. So age 40 is the rule. Breast self-exam, though, should start at age 20 for everyone. Um, and I have pictures of breast self-exam there. The recommendations have kind of changed, so I'll point those out. They lie on their back, arm up, use some sort of pattern. The preferred really is the up and down that you see on this picture, but circular, just as long as they're doing some sort of pattern that checks all the breast tissue and they need varying levels of pressure because you could have kind of superficial lumps or really deep lumps after they do that the palpation they look in the mirror the arms to your hips which tightens the pec muscles and lets you see dimpling and changes also like males breasts are asymmetric so very common for one to be bigger than the other uh, we no longer recommend that you check for nipple discharge because that's rarely a sign of cancer. It's, a, it's normal with several disorders or expected with several, so we don't do that anymore. You do always need to feel under the arm because there's breast tissue there, and that's often where cancer is. Biopsy options, quite a few, but I just want you to see the difference. In the lower right corner and the bottom, you have fine needle aspiration. It's where you put a, you do a local. You a needle directly into the lump, pull off cells, and look at them. Because you're only looking at one little area, if that's negative, they may do a full biopsy anyway to really be sure. You also see on that picture excisional and incisional biopsy. Excisional is removing the entire lump and a margin of normal tissue. Incisional is removing a piece of the lump, oftentimes because the lump's too big to remove totally. Up in the upper left corner, that picture is showing you this stereotactic biopsy. This is done laying face down with the breast through a hole in the table and then usually mammogram is the machine you see to the far right by the guy's head. Uh, mammogram is used to 
to locate the exact lump and then a gun device is used they'll do a local and then a gun device is used to take out a coarse sample so a little more cells than you get with that fine needle again it's just a local the ultrasound biopsy is really done the same way with the little gun device to take out a coarse sample but they're laying on their back and ultrasound is used to locate the lump fibrocystic breast disease um, the important thing is it does not increase your risk of breast cancer it theoretically could hide lumps that were breast cancer, but it does not make your risk higher because you have it. It is a hormonal thing. It's not really genetic. It's all hormonal based. That's why we see the, the lumps get bigger and smaller based on your period and more tender before your period. So oftentimes we find lumps that are tender we tell them to wait a week and see if it goes away because breast cancer is going to be a painless lump. Um, it's not uncommon either for them to have some nipple drainage with fibrocystic disease. Now breast cancer, you ought to know your risk factors. It is pretty rarely genetic, but hormonal, um, being exposed to hormones for long periods of time like early start to your period and a late menopause or some hormonal therapy aging, those are your risk factors. It, it, it would be a painless fixed lump, a lump that doesn't move. It can cause dimpling of the skin because that lump doesn't move. Usually we treat with mastectomy, sometimes chemo radiation, and the biggest risk after mastectomy is lymphedema. You ought to know what that is. It's where the lymph fluid can't flow because we've removed lymph nodes. And so you have to prevent for that for a lifetime. That's a risk forever. So they should have no injections on that arm, no blood pressures on that arm, and they need to protect from even minor trauma like sunburns or a pinprick because all of that could cause that lymphedema to appear. Um, dysmenorrhea, you ought to recognize that term. That term is pain. And that's usually caused by pelvic disease if it's brand new. If it's early, you know, in the 20s with periods, then that's kind of expected. But when it's new, onset in their 30s or 40s, they're, they're going to look for pelvic disease. Vaginal bleeding, again, you've got to know age. So in the young, it's usually from a miscarriage or from an ectopic pregnancy. Uh, in the 30s and 40s, it's usually due to fibroids. And oftentimes the treatment for that is a hysterectomy, not always. And then in older women, a postmenopausal woman with vaginal bleeding, you have to assume it's endometrial cancer. You rule that out first, and then it could be other things, but that's what you need to assume it is. Ectopic pregnancy is a life-threatening emergency. Patients can die from that because of shock and hemorrhage. So any female of childbearing age, with abdominal pain, we need to assume it's ectopic pregnancy until we prove otherwise because of the risk. So they'll do a pregnancy test, um, and if it is ectopic, usually they need to go straight to the operating room. Um, the birth control pills and the hormone therapy. This is always confusing to people. So estrogen by itself, which is what we typically give women that are menopausal, it causes a risk of stroke and a risk of blood clots. If you have risk already, you can't take it because then you would greatly increase your risk. So that's often where it's tested. When we give estrogen and progesterone together, which we do like for younger women who's ha who've had a hysterectomy or we do that sometimes with birth control pills, but they're a smaller dose, then you increase your risk of heart disease, breast cancer, and then stroke and blood clots. So we add some risk. So again, people are not eligible to take those hormones if they already have a risk for that or they already have it. Particularly for birth control pills that are estrogen and progesterone, you cannot smoke. If you smoke, you should not be taking them because you greatly increase your risk of DVTs. PID is pelvic inflammatory disease. Um, it's usually an STD, not always, but almost always. So the same rules apply. We need to treat their sexual partners, but with PID, we have no sex for three weeks because it is a more advanced infection that has gone up into the pelvic organs. Um, causes a big risk of infertility, actually. 
And the other weird thing is when they're hospitalized for this, which they are sometimes to get IV antibiotics, we need to keep them in semi-fowlers sitting upright to promote drainage. Endometriosis, oftentimes it's tested for symptoms. It is pain, dysmenorrhea, not bleeding, it's pain. Now, bleeding incur occurs internally, but externally it doesn't. So pain is their symptom, and surgery is the treatment. And it isn't always a cure, by the way. Cervical cancer, most common causes HPV. So pap smears is how we catch this. We catch it early. And then Gardasil is how we prevent it. Pap smears don't catch other things, just cervical cancer. That's often tested. Ovarian cancer, there is no bleeding with that. It's really vague symptoms, usually bloating, GI, abdominal things, very hard to catch. Uh, last thing on female is surgeries. Most people don't understand this, and it's commonly tested. So hysterectomy is removal only of the uterus. So look at this picture. It's in the upper left. Uterus only. A total hysterectomy is cervix and uterus. It has nothing to do with the ovaries, which are your hormone producers. So when you have a total hysterectomy, you don't have hormone problems, nor do you need to take hormones. You just don't have your uterus or cervix anymore. Salpingectomy is removal of the fallopian tubes, and oophorectomy is removal of the ovaries, what you see in the lower pictures in this, in this um, diagram here. So when we do all of that, we call that a total hysterectomy with bilateral salpingo-oophorectomy. That is where they need hormone therapy. So just be really careful you're reading carefully because total hysterectomy will not require hormone therapy. Also, they like to put vaginal versus abdominal hysterectomy on there which matters for post-op care. So if you have a vaginal hysterectomy, you'll have um, peri pads that need to be changed but no incision, and you might have some vaginal sensation problems. If you have an abdominal hysterectomy, you're going to have an incision on your abdomen, and you're, that's going to be the care. You won't have any vaginal symptoms. You're not going to have vaginal sensation problems after that. For both, though, there's a big risk of DVTs, so you've got to prevent, and you know how to do that. Last is eyes, ears, and skin, because you probably haven't had that for a while. So just a couple of things they might ask. So with eyes, remember that the eye doctor oftentimes catches systemic disease because the eyes show changes. So they may just go in for an eye exam and get sent to their medical doctor to look for things like diabetes and hypertension and even STDs, believe it or not. So lots of things can manifest in the eyes. Glaucoma is increased intraocular pressure. There are two types, open angle and angle closure. Angle closure is the medical emergency so you ought to recognize that. They get sudden severe eye pain. They might get redness, vision changes. And the treatment for that, the emergency treatment, is IV or oral mannitol, which you should remember is a diuretic that we use with intracranial pressure. And then we give only meiotic eye drops to them, and that's drops that will um, constrict their pupil. You do not want to give them dilators, the mydriatics because uh, you'll actually make this worse. So after that, the critical thing, the treatment for glaucoma are beta blocker eye drops typically. Timoptic is the most common one. And remember that beta blocker eye drops can cause systemic symptoms. So you always have to have them close their eyes or do punctal occlusion to prevent that from being absorbed into the body. Um, because if it's absorbed, you're going to get the same symptoms as you would get with beta blockers, which you should remember is low heart rate and a low blood pressure. So anybody that has cardiac or respiratory disease, we would be cautious to give them eye drops, which is important to remember. Cataracts, the pupil looks white like you see in this picture. You can try to prevent their development by using sunglasses, especially when you're young, because that exposure to UV light contributes to it, as does aging. 
What's usually asked on this is about the surgery, the post-op care, and the big thing is this. Most patients who have surgery are going to have significant pain the first day or two, and we expect that. That is not true with um, cataract surgery. They should have very little pain. So if they have pain post-op, that's critical and should be called to the doctor. The other big thing is to keep their intraocular pressure low. You do that the same way you keep intracranial pressure low. So you might review that if you don't remember that. Uh, last, I think, retinal detachment. This is where they have a sudden change in their vision. Often it's strange, like a curtain coming down, like you see in this picture, or cobwebs, or weird things like that. They need to be treated. And the treatment is sometimes bed rest, or they do various procedures, but one of the weirdest is putting a bubble, a gas bubble, in their eye. And then that gas bubble presses against that detachment until it closes up. When they have that, they have to be positioned a certain way. And it varies based on where that detachment is. So it may be that they need to be face down at all times for six weeks. Or they need to be at 90 degrees at all times for six weeks. So that's kind of a weird thing you might remember. Ears, not a lot to say about ears. A couple of reminders. If you have an inner ear problem, that can affect your balance. If your balance is affected, your safety risk. Uh, the term presbycusis, that's hearing loss due to aging. You might remind yourself of the ototoxic meds, the salicylates, aspirin, aminoglycosides, those are your mycins, but really a lot of your antibiotics do this. The antimalarials, quinine, chemo, diuretics, and NSAIDs. Last thing is on ears is eardrops. Remember they need to be at room temperature, they can make you dizzy. And for adults, you pull the ear up and back to straighten the ear canal. For kids, you do down and back. And this is um, commonly tested in peds for sure. So I put them both on there for you. Last one, skin. The biggest thing with skin is about melanoma. So most of you know this when I've checked in the past. So this should be a quick review for you. Remember the risk factors, fair skin type, blonde hair, blue eyes, red hair, green eyes, um, they're at more risk. Chronic sun exposure, whether that's because you work outside or you have hobbies outside or you love to suntan or you go to the tanning bed, all of those increase your risk. And there is a genetic component to this too. Uh, the ABCDE rule, most of you already know that, so there's the reminder if you don't. Melanoma versus non-melanoma. Non-melanomas are uh, basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma, and then the precancerous actinic keratosis. Those don't involve melanocytes at all. They just involve the epidermis, and so they're not really usually deadly. They can cause a lot of disfigurement, but not deadly. Melanoma is deadly, and you see what we're looking for. The treatment is usually chemo, radiation, and excision. You don't ever incision biopsy. You don't take a piece. You always remove the entire thing to biopsy this so that we don't accidentally spread it. And these commonly metastasize. The last thing is PUVA. That's on there because I saw it on your topic list. So PUVA is Sorolin and UVA light therapy. And what they do is they give oral or topical sorolin a couple of hours before you come in and have the light exposure. You have to use goggles to protect your eyes, and it has several risks. It increases your sun sensitivity for both your eyes and your skin for several days afterwards, even indoors. And it increases your risk of skin cancer and cataracts because you're being exposed to that UV light. Um, but it is it is a good treatment for skin disorders, particularly like psoriasis and actually several skin disorders. All right, good luck.